So for our latest video, we are out method feeder fishing, where hopefully I'm gonna tell you how to take your method fishing just to that next level. So we are here at the wonderful Monk Hall Fishery for a go on the Hawk Pool, which I'm actually quite excited about. I've not had a, a go on this like yet. And as I said, what we want to do is some method feeder fishing, or some flat method fishing, not the conventional method feeder types. That's what we're going to focus on today. And as with everything else in fishing, there's definitely an evolution of every method. And without doubt, method feeder fishing is the one thing that by paying attention to the little details, making little changes in terms of your feeder, the bait that's on your feeder and your hook bait, it can make massive, massive differences to what you're catching, how the fish are behaving, and just making the most of your day. And that's what I really want to get across today. The, the fishing's almost the last thing on the list. It's getting everything else right that leads to just the method working better than it could if you just budge it, quickly chuck some pellets on and throw it out. That's definitely not the way we want to do things now. There's, there's ways of doing things and for me it was all about breaking a method feeder down into different ways yeah when you're fishing a method depending what you're doing you could be chucking it on a big lake like Barston or Boddington you fish a method there in a very different way to how you'd fish a venue like this a small intimate style venue with a lot more fish with shallower water it, it all needs to be thought about before you decide exactly how you're going to fish that feeder or what your bait's going to do, you know, all the little things I'm going to go through. And today we're going to focus on the, the small, intimate style commercials where in today's case we're chucking to a, a nice island in fairly shallow water with potentially a lot of fish involved. I mean, there could be a lot of fish feeding today. It's going to be potentially fast and furious fishing. And this is the type of fishing I'm doing a lot. I mean, using it at venues like me, me local up at Lingmere, a few pegs on Heronbrook. There's quite a few venues where you have these small chucks um, when you're catching carp and F1s that you need to, to, to be quite proficient at this sort of feeder fishing. So that's one I want to pass on my little bit of information to you that hopefully make a difference. And the first thing I want to talk about is we're going to go on to bait prep next. But having the right pellets, the way they're going to break down, for me, that's the most important aspect of your feeder fishing. It's what, what dictates what goes on into your peg. And that's the main focus is how my pellets are going to break down. So flat style feeders, what they sort of let you achieve is that uh, the edges of the feeder maintain your pellets. They keep your pellets in. So they're a brilliant application, if you like, for getting your bait to the bottom when it's not going to be quite as perfect as it used to be with conventional style method feeders that were, I mean, flat style method feeders. By having the edges, they allow me to to mess it about my bait a bit more and have it a bit softer than it would be, a bit harder than it would be, but still gets down to the bottom. And with what I'm gonna go through with the, the bait prep is that's exactly what I'm trying to achieve is different pellets or different textures of pellets that'll either break down very, very quickly and put bait into my peg really quickly to build a peg up, or on the flip side of that, that may break down really, really, really slowly that create a, a different presentation, if you like, if them fish get a little bit preoccupied by the pellets. I don't want too many pellets in my peg, but I still need my bait to be over a bed of pellets. Then I might need a pellet that stays on my feeder. So you're not always after the, the conventional thought about broken down pile of lovely pellets with your bait on top. It looks perfect. It's often not the right way of going about things when you feed a fishing, because you definitely find that in, in two flip ways, the fish either hunt your bait out and you get bites really quickly if they're feeling confidently, but on the other side, they can also avoid that bait. If it's in a nice flat pile, they can pick up whatever they want. They can become very, very difficult to catch. So next, I wanna move on to preparing the pellets just to make sure I've got two options so I can get them to do exactly what I want them to do on the day. Right, so as I mentioned, there's gonna be potential situations when I'm after different breakdowns in my pellets. I so said that's very, very, very important to have when you're method feeder fishing, so your pellets just don't behave in one way, because that could be incorrect for how the fish are wanting to feed. 
So what I do is prepare my two batches, two different batches of pellets in two different ways. So I've got different breakdown rates. I say mega, mega easy, no matter what pellets you have, just by soaking them in different, or for different lengths of time, if anything, you can create a different breakdown of that pellet or a breakdown of the feeder. And that's exactly what I've done here. I've got these already in my tub of water there. They are ready to go. They've been left for about four or five minutes, so quite a long time. But remember, we're, we're fishing a, a flat method feeder. So it's not a method feeder that's got a, a conventional method that's got to hold a bit, uh, bait on the ball. This is for a flat feeder that's going to help that bait stay on as well. So you've got that added advantage to your pellets being able to be a bit softer because the feeder is going to keep them on to get them to the bottom. What I'm going to do is quickly drain them off anyway. So they're going to get whizzed off. So they've had about five minutes, four or five minutes they've had. What I'm going to do is wring that water out as much as I can. And it gives me a lovely soft pellet that is nearly good to go straight away. But we're going to focus on that a bit more. We're going to have a look in a tank in a minute just to see how quickly they'll break down. However, what I'm also after is a very, very slow breakdown feeder as well, because I don't know how the fishing's going to be, whether they're going to be attacking that feeder. What I'm going to need, I'm not quite sure yet. So I need a different batch of pellets that are going to be done in a different way. And all they're going to be done is literally a quick dunk. I'm going to give them 10 seconds, just let the water sort of get to them. And then exactly the same as I've done with the last lot, just drain them off, leave them dry out a bit. And what they should create, if I can show you in a minute, is a, a feeder that's a lot more frustrating to the fish. It's going to hold my bait onto that feeder really, really well. It's going to be take a long time to break down, but it's going to agitate the fish. It's going to give the potential um, annoyance to the fish, so they're going to be desperate to get at my hook bait because it doesn't break down as quickly. So hopefully these pellets are going to show you exactly what's going on there. So they've probably had, what, 10 seconds, 20 seconds maybe, by the time I'd finished babbling. And it is as simple as that. So like I say, your first lot are going to be anywhere between three to five minutes, depending how hot the water is, depending on the temperature, depending on the actual batch of pellets themselves as well. You often have to have a little play with them to see what they're doing. But say in that case, it's a nice four minute leave. And with these ones, quick dunk, and they're going to create a really tight feeder as opposed to these that are going to make a feeder that breaks down really, really quickly. So it gives me the best of options, depending on what them fish want on the day. So my pellets now, I'm happy with how they both they came out. They've been soaked for the required amount of time and they're, they're suitable for the breakdown that I'm trying to achieve with, with each batch of pellets. But what I want to do is got the tank out. It's been a long time since the old tank came out. Uh, and I want to show you the breakdown of the pellets just to see how different it is that allows me to swap depending on what them fish are doing. You say it may be a case of the tricky to catch at the start, so I don't want to put too much bait in the peg, or it could be that the fish are feeding really ravenously and I want to get a load of bait in the peg. So by judging how my pellets behave on the feeder, I can actually judge how much I'm leaving in my peg each cast, whether I need to top my peg up, whether I need to annoy them into taking my bait or, or whatever. It just gives me options, which if you don't mess about with your pellets to give yourself options, it leaves you very, very limited in what you can do because you've only got one type of pellet that does one thing that if the fish aren't feeding in that way, you're going to catch less fish. So what I'm going to do, I've made my feeders up nice and quick, Blue Peter style I'm going to put my slow break, uh, my fast breakdown one in first. They're the ones that have been softened for a lot longer. They, they've really softened. They're almost what I'd feed on my pole. And then the second feeder that's going to go in is the ones that have just been dunked. There are a lot of the crispy pellet sort of thing is what, you'd, what I'd like to call them. And immediately you can see the activity is so much different on them both. The ones that have been soaked for a lot longer are really, really soft. They want to break down really, really quickly. And what in turn they give me is sort of a fast bite that I can put bait in my peg really, really quick. I mean, the fish are attacking my feeder. I'm going to get a bite really quickly because they're feeding confidently, they're easier to catch. Alternatively, I've got the second feeder that's a lot more dense. I mean, they're exactly the same pellets as well. I've not played any tricks. They are exactly the same fishery pellets out the same bag that say they've had the, the long soak and the short soak but the difference in the two feeders is unreal. Yeah, the feeder on the, on the right as you're looking at it, it's so much more dense it keeps it nice and tight. So it's not putting very, very little bait in the peg. And what it actually does, that feeder annoys the fish into having my hook bait because it's not spilling out all over the place. It's staying very, very contained within the feeder. And in turn, I can have my hook bait right on top of that. And they're attacking it really, really angrily, frustrated in a way. So as soon as my hook bait gets released, I can catch a fish. But in turn, it also puts very, very little bait in my peg. So by using the same size of feeder, swapping about my pellets, I can regulate the amount of bait going into my peg just by using the different pellets at different points of time. But that, that's the key thing I'm after is to have variation in my pellets. What, what's the word? Versatility with my bait. 
I can play about with the two different types and then it keeps me in contact with what's going on. I mean, it gives me options and hopefully that way leads me to catching much more steadily in catch, instead of catching in base than what it would if I only had one type of pellet. So with all my bait prepped up, I've got my pellets there ready to go. Next thing I want to have a look at is hook baits. And I'm a big believer when it comes to method feeder fishing that your actual hook bait, what it is, isn't the most important thing in the world. It's how that hook bait behaves that is, it's massive when it comes to whether that fish eats it, accepts it, avoids it, whatever. So what I do is break it down into two different ways. In that I've got a hook length on my first rig that I'll go through first that I'd like to refer to as my sort of accidental hook bait. And that's going to be a really light hook bait, such as a maggot, maybe a wafter in extreme situations for big fish on big places, but I honestly don't believe wafters have a place at, at little venues like this. Um, but I want a light hook bait, such as a maggot, um, an expander, a ready done expander, even a hard expander sometimes on a band, but that's a, a different thing altogether. But the main emphasis is that really light, the, the fragile hook bait that they're going to suck up the pile and the bait goes into their mouth by accident. I mean, I've shown that on a few videos in the past by catching fish. I mean, lots and lots of fish with just a band on, with no bait whatsoever. It just shows that often your bait can work as sort of an avoidance thing, that if you've got a too big a bait on or a heavy bait, often the fish can be a little bit, generally later in the year, they can be a bit moody and they can deliberately avoid that bait. It gives them something big that they can, say, not eat at all or they can spit out. With little diddy baits like this, with a little maggot and expand or whatever else, it almost goes in by accident. And by the time they swallow it all, it's too late to on. And that's my hook length for doing that. Generally, a, a smaller fish thing, a later in the session thing, a moody thing, when fish aren't really feeding confidently, but it can far outscore anything. When they are a little bit dubious to what they're eating, a little diddy hook like that is definitely the way to go. And that's what's going to be my me, me go-to today when it goes a bit difficult later in the session. But for that, really, really simple. Hook length, length, I want the smallest I'm allowed. I mean, if the fishery allows two inch, I'll use a two inch, if not three inch. I tend to not go any longer really for this style of fishing than a three inch. You want something nice and short that's going to hook them fish quick. And in that case, I've got 016 or 016.5 hook length. So fairly durable. But again, I'm catching small fish, so I want it not too stiff. If I go too heavy on the diameter, because it's such a light hook bait, it's going to spring up my method. Drop it a little bit lower, sort of at 016 is about as low as we go that allows my bait to stay on my pile within reason depends how i load my feeder but we'll touch on that in a minute and keep things where i want it so lastly i've got an 18 hook in that case i've got an 18 mxc3 which is pretty much the smallest mxc3 we do that's nice and heavy so it'll i mean absorb the bounce of the feeder it's not going to be a soft hook but it's really really light it's all about the say the accidental rig that's what we're calling it them in taking that bait in almost without knowing. So of course there's the option, they, they can still pick it up if they want to, but that for me, Metaphy is not about that. It's all about them picking it up by accident. That said, firstly, what I want is my go-to rig. And when they're confident at the start, when they're a bit stupid and they haven't seen it all, I want something more positive instead. Because with Method Feeder Fishing, it's about them hooking themselves. I mean, there's nothing we can do to hook the fish. You can't strike or anything like that. They've got to do it themselves. So what I want, what I'd rather have, I'm more confident in than a, a little delicate rig, is a really angry rig that gets that hook right in the middle of that bottom lip and I'll land the fish. And that's in turn is my, is my go-to rig that I'm going to start with, with a heavy bait. So this hook length all about, slightly bigger feeder, but that's just for me to have a play about with, but a really, really big hook with a really, really heavy bait, which is so important. In this case, I've either got a, a sinking boily, so not a wafter version, I want them to sink like a stone, or I may use one of my big pellets. I may use a, who knows what, big heavy red pellet, an eight mil pellet, a six mil pellet. The, the emphasis is on heavy, on weight. For this, it's going to keep it over my pile. Uh, that's the most important thing when it comes to method feeder fishing, is keeping that bait over the top of the pile. As soon as it goes away from your bait, yes, a fish could eat it, but for me, the home and in point is always about that pile. Yeah, as soon as your bait deviates off it, there's less chance of catching a fish because of that accidental ingestion of your bait. And what I'm always after is my bait to be heavy enough to stay on that pile. I mean, these fish don't mess about. If you've got fish sort of, maybe 10 ounce plus, it's ridiculous how quickly they'll eat your bait. Um, they'll come in, they will suck that whole pile up literally in one go. And if your bait isn't over the top of it, then there's less chance you're getting that, that bite. So that's what this rig's all about. 
So I've put a nice big heavy boilie on for now just for demonstrative purposes to show you that my go-to is going to be a pellet today. And what I'm actually going to do, I'm going to load it really quick because for me loading it's really, really important as well to um, emphasise that self-hooking. Yeah, it's no good just bodging your, your hook bait into it willy-nilly. It could cover your hook up. It's, it's not going to work as well as it could. I mean, you have to have almost a like an obsession with setting that trap because that's what you're doing. You're chucking your method feeder. It's a trap on the bottom. If your hook isn't working the way you want it to because your bait's obscuring it or whatever else, then you, it's pointless what you're doing. So every little thing needs to be thought about as well as it possibly can. So what I'm going to do is load my feeder as I'm doing just a little bit to start with. And then because it's on a band, this is one of the few times that I'll fish a pellet or a boiler on a band on a feeder. What it allows me to do is just to press it in slightly, but not too much because I want it to be able to be released. And if we have a look at that, it leaves my hook in the perfect position to hook a, hook a fish. So this is all deviated from years ago with Teddy Earn videos, like the carpy type fishing. That's what you're doing. You're carp fishing for smaller sort of species. And that's how we have to think of it, that your trap is set all the time. So by having my hook upwards, ready to go straight into the middle of that bottom lip, it just keeps everything perfect and the weight of the bait as well keeps it over the top of that pile as it breaks down it's just a perfect trap it keeps it nice but what i will do is just cover it as well really really gently i don't want to cover that too tightly because the last thing i want to do is move that hook i want that hook i'm going to call it vertically but facing upwards all the time i don't want it squashed down as soon as my hook's flat or going into the feeder then there's less chance of it hooking the fish when it sucks in i want it right in the right position straight away and hopefully that's what it achieves on that one again. Same again, very similar hook length material. I've stepped up to 015 on M018 um, on that one. Just because it's all a bit angry and a bit nasty, I can land them a bit quicker. And hook size, I've gone really big. Now I've got no qualms whatsoever about using the biggest possible hook I'm allowed. So in that case, I've got a 12, a big size 12 MXC3, which is a serious, serious lump of metal. But they're not going to look at the hook. The hook's in the right place. They're going to focus on that big heavy bait and the hooks in turn with it being so big is what makes sure it goes in that bottom lip and the fish is on before I pick a rod up. So that's pretty much all I'm gonna cover with me two um, hook length options. So it's about working out what's best at the time on the day. So if the fish are being moody, then it's much better to get them to pick it up by accident. If they're really confident, they're racing in, they're eating bait quickly, then a bigger, more visual bait that's gonna stay on the pile is gonna be the way to go. But again, having two options just with everything else gives us that versatility and allows us to switch about a bit. Right, so with everything sorted, or bait-wise, I can get to do a bit of fishing. But if I'm completely honest, so with the method feeder fishing lark, the tips definitely are. The, the, the way to make it better is a lot more on the bank with the things I've gone through rather than the actual fishing. You know, the fishing itself is all about learning, reading, doing things like that, which we're going to touch on, of course, but it's, it's the sexy things like that, presenting your bait in the right way, using the right pellets at the right time. That's going to be the key thing, but I still get to have a fish. So what I'm not going to do, I'm clipped up already. I'm not going to talk about that. Clipping up's just a case of having practice, uh, wanting to be where you want it to be. I mean, your casting is, is something that you've got to work on to make that better. What I will say though, is you need to utilize your line clip a lot more when you are chucking to Ireland. Yeah, the, the way you need to break your feeder fishing down when you're chucking up to something is that treat it exactly the same as if you were fishing a pole. So sometimes you may want to be right in the shallow water, tight to the island, which is where my, uh, my furthest line clip will be or where my line will be clipped up to on, on my reel. But I've always got the options of clipping back another metre, putting my rod in a different position when I hit my clip, whatever else. You've got to use those sorts of things to, to try different areas. Don't just chuck it in the same bit all the time. You chuck it to an island. Because for all you know, there could be a lot of fish further down that slope just as if you were pole fishing. So that's the sort of thing you need to play about with, with the areas you're chucking. Other than that, again, you need to treat um, your fishing like you do on the pole with your feeding as well. So what you haven't got with the feeder, you've not got the options of laying your rigging and things like that. So the only attraction purposes you have is either regular casting or feeding over the top. They're the only two attraction properties that you've got. And so reading your peg, it, it just comes into it as you fish. You've got to keep an eye on where you're getting your bites and what you've got to do to make them bites happen. But still, what I'm going to do is start my session as if I've just had a go and, and catch a few fish. So I've started on my angry rig. I mean, much more positive rig with a heavy hook bait that's going to stay over my pile. And I'm also going to start on my quick breakdown pellets that are going to put bait into my peg really quickly. 
because for the first few casts, what I want to do is make sure I've got bait going into the peg so there's fish in the area and they're also easier to catch at the start when they're a little bit stupid, a bit more confident, they're going to be easier to catch. So I've got me much angrier, bigger feeder to catch a few fish on that. I'm going to chuck that in before I have a little chat to you. So I've gone pretty much right on today. I'm going to start right in the shallow water today because there's a lot of fish feeding. And what I've gone with, I've gone with a 20 gram interfeeder, which the size of feeder for me, you just need to pick whatever size feeder you need to deliver the amount of chosen bait that you want on the day. I mean, th there's no right and wrong. You may want a little tiny feeder that ticks over all day, that'll be on. Or you may want a big feeder that puts loads of bait in your peg, gets fish into your peg really fast and, and has them going crazy. It, it's Every day's different. I can't tell you what's right, what's wrong. For me today, I felt a medium feeder was right to give them a little bit of bait, but at the same time, not have them crawling all over my peg, getting too excited. Catching loads of hide. That's a bit weird, isn't it? But it gives me a quick bite. And say, so with that, that feeder I've just chucked in, as I said, it's the, the fast breakdown feeder which allows, look how that even a, an eye took perfectly, allows the fish to access my bait really, really, really fast because the bait's coming off the feeder within 10, 20 seconds without a fish getting involved. So if the fish attack it, maybe even faster, but still I've got a bit of bait on my feeder, which I love to see, especially when I get a bite that fast. So let's load him up again. So same again with these fast breakdown pellets. Another thing worth mentioning that I didn't do when I was landing it then, is that on a separate note, we're talking about kit. At the minute, I'm obsessed with shock leaders. And I think that using a, a shock leader, so in today's case, I've got six pound mainline with a 10 pound Horizon mono shock leader. So I think it has a massive advantage in both durability of your rig and knowing where the fish are when you're playing them. So it's lovely when you, you're cranking it in, you can hear that knock going through my rod and you know exactly when to lift the rod because you can feel your shock leader. Plus it's got that abrasion resistance when I'm catching loads and loads of fish. I've got the, the durability of that heavy line, which even on a little venue like this with a, a 20 meter chuck, so it definitely makes a difference having that. So kit of the day, dead, dead simple. I'm not going to babble on about that. I've got 10 foot. Um, I've got bomb rods instead of feeder rods. I've used 10 foot horizon bombs instead of feeders, mainly because I'm catching fish like what I've just caught. There's quite a few eyed, quite a few um, big F1s, an odd skimmer. I, I want something soft. I mean, even though I'm using really heavy kit, having a soft rod just makes them a bit nicer and easier to play. There's less chance of losing them fish. Obviously, if I was at a venue full of five pounders or bigger, then you get a fish feeder on instead with a bit of pokiness. And you know I mean, I, 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 that kit's nice and simple. It just does what I want it to do on the day. But onto the centre boat now, onto the fishing. And I'm going to have quite regular casts at first with this feeder because what I'm after is that introduction of bait, get them to sort of respond to the plop of the bait going in, get some bait on the bottom, get some fish in the peg. Because what I would expect at this time of year, when it's still, it's gonna be fairly good, is a quick response to catch three or four fish really quickly before they get a bit clever and that they know what that feeder is. And I mean, they start eating the pellets that aren't on the feeder instead knowing they're safe. And when that starts to happen, let's tighten up a little bit on that. When that starts to happen, I can swap to my second batch of pellets. That me annoying them pellets that are going to stick to my feeder a lot more, they're going to release far less bait. And hopefully they're going to pick up my bait just out of frustration, if you like, because they can't get to the micros because they're not coming off the feeder as easy. So that's my second option. So aside from that, I've also got my second rod set up that I showed with my, my little feeder and the magaton. Maybe accidental ingestion hook bait that I can swap to that. So within the, the two different pellets and the two setups, now I've potentially got four different variations of how my feed is gonna be, which gives me a lot of things to swap about on the day to work out what right, depending what's right, depending what the fish are doing on the day. So it's, it's about versatility, that'll be on. And being able to work out how them fish are feeding. Is that a bit bigger? That one swam right towards me, that one. I'd say even with an eye, it, it's, it's nice. You can just keep your rod down, keep cranking. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to hear them knots ticking through my rod rings, I mean, my stop knot knot, which is there. And I'm going to want to lift up, and I know it's right underneath me. What's going to be in? What's he? He's a big eyed. He's perfect netting distance when I've got probably three turns on my reel. Depends, depends how much the fish is pulling, but either two to three turns, I know to lift up, net me fish, and I'm not worrying about 
reeling again once I lift up. Definitely not the expected species for method feeder fishing. But here we go. So this time we're gonna have another cast with the, the slow breakdown pellet. So just make sure every cast has to spend time making sure I load it correctly. Yeah, that trap, I can't emphasize how much it's worth spending time creating the right trap. You're putting all that effort into casting into the right place, loading your feeder. You may as well do it properly to ensure that when one eats it, you get a bite instead of just chucking your bait in there, potentially masking your hook and a fish sucking it in, spitting it out without you ever knowing it occurred. And all of a sudden you're catching far less just because you're loading your feeder a bit lazily and a bit too quick. That's so much better. That's how we want it. Ooh, an angry one. That's not going to be an eye, is it? You can see that the response to begin with, because my pellets are doing what they're doing, like that bite then came within 10 seconds on it. I mean, of my feeder landing, that's came within 10 seconds. For the fish to be able to get to my bait, those pellets are breaking down ever so quickly, which you know, in this situation, it's right, because the fish are straight on it. If I was waiting a lot longer for bites, however, then I'd much rather tighten my pellets up, get them to break down a lot slower with me, with me crunchy pellet. I wasn't paying attention, I was gabbing with this one then instead of counting me turns on landing it. But yeah, I could easily swap to me crunchy pellets that break down a lot slower if I'm not getting the bite. So that, in combination with trying to read my peg, working out where I need to be casting, how regular I need to cast if, if I'm they're responding to the feeder going in, whether I need to feed over the top of it with pellets to attract them. I mean, all these things that you can think about need to be sort of employed. So you see them again, everyone is bang on, they're right where we want to be catching them and there's pretty much zero chance of losing any of them fish because of how well they're hooked. I'll put one of them on. liking that so there's no need for changing anything yet i'm going to continue with with this until things change on my tip as soon as that tip starts behaving differently and that i start getting lots of indications and not bites that'll be the indicator for me to, to change things i mean if i get no bites whatsoever then that dictates that i've got to attract fish i mean it's not my feeder that's wrong if i'm not getting any bites or any indications then it's just that i'm in the wrong depth or i need to draw fish into my swim so that'll change with as the session goes, but the decisions that lead me to change my, my pellets or my feeder, then they're all shown up by the tip itself, that it's moving, there's clearly fish in the swim, but I'm not getting a bite, which is so often the case when, when you're method feeder fishing, it's about getting that tip to go round rather than just see that there's fish there. I want clean, nice, proper bites. I don't want to see my tip bouncing about. I want to see it sat there, maybe a couple of little indications, and then I want to see it go round very, very quickly. So the longer your feeder's in the water, getting knocked about, is that on? No. The longer the feeder's in the water, getting knocked about, and I'm not uh, getting a proper bite catching a fish, the more chance my bait's been sucked in, spat out, it isn't where I want it to be anymore, and I'm not fishing efficiently, it's not where I want it to be. So I'm have a couple more casts with this. A little bit shallower on that one. Seems to be today that I've had a sneaky go before we've started and very typically it seems that the tighter I am the more chance I've got of a carp. If I drop it down a little bit into that slightly deeper water because it's a little bit of a slope here. If it's in the slightly deeper water I tend to catch an eyed. If it's really tight I catch a carp. But it's nice rotating the two. You still, hopefully you can see with that tip, I am literally getting no indications whatsoever, or very, very few indications. And we're just getting a bite, which in the minute tells me everything's right. I'm catching fast enough to be happy with the, the target weight I'm hoping to catch. And I can just leave things as their own without the need to up the casting rate, without the need to feed over the top. I can just keep it as it is. But I'm sure throughout the day that is going to change multiple times if it's a, a normal day.
So what after has been a very, very enjoyable session catching some fish on a rod, although lots of species that weren't quite expected. Hopefully I've gone through all the, the key sort of tips for me that definitely make a massive difference to my little intimate method feeder fishing sort of thing. It, it's not about the actual decisions you're making when you're fishing, although of course they're key as they always are. But when it comes to feeder fishing or method feeder in particular, there's so much more that you can do on the bank, actually before you cast your feeder in, that can improve things, that can make your feeder fishing better, in increase your catch rate, whatever else. So it's, you need to pay attention to detail. That is the, the key thing for me. And hopefully I've been able to put a few, a few of them things across to you today. So as always, thank you very, very much for watching. If you want to see more of these sorts of videos, like and subscribe to the Matrix page and you will see plenty of content from me and the other Matrix consultants.